So the focus of this lecture is to look at basic linear circuit concepts and build the foundation <clears throat> we can talk about for circuits in general, but also talking about it for linear circuits. Now there's a few things we're going to need to go through, but the beauty of this lecture is that once we're done, we pretty much have covered all the physics that we're going to need for this entire, for basically doing linear circuits. Now if you're doing nonlinear circuits or transistors, you get to do some more things, uh, and that gets to be fun. But in terms of linear circuits, this is basically the, the core of what you need. So a couple key things at the beginning. Circuits are effectively graphs, and they're basically components connected by connections. Those connections are wires. Those wires are considered ideal. Okay, so a connection has no resistance, no inductance, no capacitance. You might go, well, wait, I have a physical wire. I know it's not perfect. Well, it isn't, and we model that with the <clears throat> resulting components. But otherwise, we would consider it ideal. The other thing typically, as we'll see these graphs, typically often the ones we're going to build could eventually flatten to a two-dimensional graph. It's a useful little, little point, not always essential, and we can get into those details. But you're probably not going to ever run into that, but you'll notice it might show up in occasional circuit theorems. The thing that you'll also see sometimes is people say we need to have a DC path to ground, and this is often true, but not always true. The reason you want to do this an assumption is it assumes that the graph of the circuit there has no other parameters. There's no charge storage or anything else. This works for certain problems, but it doesn't work for a number, a number of circuits. And so what you need to be able to do is just kind of know that this is in the back of your mind, because you'll see examples in linear circuits where this is not the case. So just be aware of that. It'll have some impact. Now, the physics on that graph, there are two things in there. One is there will be no charge storage, okay? So that there will be no charge storage, no additional charge storage at a node uh, being built up unless you have, say, a capacitance or something else doing that. And so we'll see in that case what we call Kirchhoff's current law, it's KCL for those who've seen this before, which is really a beautiful theorem that basically says all the currents going into a node have to equal all the currents out of the node. If you prefer to say the sum of all the currents going into the node is zero, or the sum of all the currents going out of the node is zero, those work. Why would I say it in different terms like that? Well, it depends on which way I draw the, draw the currents. And I can draw them, I can define them in, in arbitrary ways, I just need to stay consistent. So if I draw all the currents going into a node being identical, being the same, then I know that the sum of them has to be zero. So somebody has to be going out as well as going in. Which one? It'll just depend on the sign. Otherwise, everything is completely consistent. That's one of the important things with these graphs, is just know that everything tends to be consistent if you just state a one sort of form of the definitions. The second case is in Kirchhoff's voltage law. And again, this is a case of a loop. If I take any loop and I take the sum of the voltages all the way around the loop, signed accordingly, and of course here you see I'll be defining V2 and V3 and V4 in a particular direction. If I take the sum of those, I would then know that that has to be equal to zero. If I start at one point, and I go all the way around and go back to that same point, I expect that the voltage is going to, the net change in voltage is zero. And so that's a very simple definition on the graph. In this case, I would say that it would be V1 minus V2 minus V4 minus V3 equals to zero. Now again, I've chosen those voltages somewhat arbitrarily. Um, you can, you'll ha it'll be some of it is the art, but you can, as long as you define them and then work with them consistently, everything is fine. Uh, where people usually get in trouble is they start thinking, oh, you know, they start getting confused between multiple concepts. Again, just at a ground level, <laughs> keep things consistent and it should be fine. I define them in particular because I know that this will eventually look like V1 is equal to the sum of V2, V4, and V3. So you can often choose things to be very helpful in your analysis, and this, you'll, you'll notice this will happen often. So once you have sort of those aspects of the graphs, then it's a question of what are the sources I get to work with? So I get a couple things, and let's talk about the basic components first. These are going to be basic circuits. We're talking about resistors, capacitors, and inductors. And you may have experienced these in other places. 
and one could talk about a whole bunch of physics of how do resistors work or capacitors work in terms of two plates and inductors, but realize that at this point we're pretty much good with a couple different definitions. Resistor would be if I define a voltage across it plus to minus and the current goes from plus to minus, so now it is an element that is dissipating energy. What I'm going to find is that the relationship is voltage is going to be equal to the resistance times the current. V equals Ri. Many of you have probably seen this, but if not, this is what we're going to be using. Um, we don't need a whole lot of other, other definitions of, of the level we're doing here. Capacitor, we're going to talk about the current again as a voltage across it. That current is going to be the current equals to the capacitance times the change in voltage over time. Now that charge, actually it's really charge equals CV, and so in this particular case, that's the fundamental thing, and the way I get to current is I take a derivative of this expression. In this particular case, I can definitely, in this case, I can definitely see that I would get current from the voltage, but I don't have the current going through the parallel plates, and this is important to also understand. In the physical case, the current is not going through that, but I'm having a certain amount of positive current this way. I'm having current leaving on this terminal, and it's going to look like it's a current through the device. When I look at an inductor, I'm going to have a voltage that's now going to be proportional to the derivative of current. Really, you're talking about a magnetic flux storing device, and so you get the sort of the opposite case. This is kind of nice, so I get both cases of, of, of derivatives that I can work with in a circuit. And in fact, as I hook this up into a graph, this sort of feels like I'm going to get a lot of different differential equations. Now, the other things we have to add to that are independent sources, or voltage sources, which some of you may have seen before because this would look like a battery, but this is going to be an ideal device. So the voltage that I'm going to get will always be, um, will always be the same no matter what current. Now, let me just repeat that. <laughs> no matter what current it draws, I'm going to get the same voltage. Now, in practice, you know that typical devices don't do this, a battery doesn't do this, and a battery is an example of this, and you'll see that used for such a symbol, although this is primarily the symbol I will always use. But the reality is we'd model that in other ways, with, say, resistors or other components. You can also get a current source, which means it's going to supply a current independent of the voltage that's across those two terminals. And you might say, what is a current source? And it turns out you can build them, you can even buy some, uh, but you usually effectively get them by using transistor circuit elements. So this is where, where, where this begins. We also have one more class of elements, and this is something almost certainly you're not too familiar with unless you've done circuits before, which are talking about dependent sources. And this is basically, again, I'm either going to have an ideal voltage source, where it's going to be the same voltage no matter a current, or a current source independent of voltage, but now they depend on volt other voltages or currents in the circuit. And sometimes this is considered makes some circuits look more complicated. That's not the point. The reason we're doing this is that these typically are elements that are used in, say, transistor circuits and other types of store elements, and they open up a whole range of other capabilities that otherwise would not be possible in terms of um, control or computation or just signal conditioning. So that's where we begin. And the thing to understand is that this all creates a complete set that we're going that we would look at for linear circuits. Now, that's really good because from this point on, if one is doing a linear circuits class, um, as I imagine many of you are, <laughs> what you're what you're now realizing is that everything else is intuition, measurements, measurements that help your intuition, and mathematics and mathematical concepts to build up. You can solve every circuit from these definitions, and I would, if you, I would absolutely make these definitions committed to memory. And if you can do that, then anything can be solved. And now it's a question of how the intuition and what you're expecting as you're building this up.